Welcome everyone to Half History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and in this video I will be discussing one of Patrick Claiborne's most famous moments when he attempted to solve the Confederate manpower problem. As Claiborne settled into winter quarters north of Dalton, Georgia, he began to construct a proposal that he had been thinking about since at least the spring. He looked around and saw that the Army of Tennessee could barely field 35,000 men, and all commanders began to call for more troops from the Confederate government. Conscription had brought thousands of men into the Army, but more were needed, and the age range would be extended to encompass more men. Claiborne also took notice of the high casualties that the Confederacy suffered in battles and knew that those men were irreplaceable, even if victorious in battle. Therefore, he proposed enlisting slaves into the Confederate Army. For their service, they should grant the slaves their freedom, along with their families. He basically gave the South an ultimatum. They could either have independence, or they could have slavery, but they could not have both. In April, he even mentioned it to his brigade commander, St. John Liddell, who was receptive to the idea. His staff was not receptive. In particular, his chief of staff, Calhoun Benham, was appalled at the proposal. He advised Claiborne to not bring these ideas to anyone else, but that would not deter Patrick. One of his artillery battery commanders, Captain Thomas Key, was brought into Claiborne's tent and asked whether he would support drilling and arming hundreds of thousands of slaves for Confederate service in the Confederate Army. Key argued that they could not be induced to fight and that they would make poor soldiers. Claiborne disagreed and believed they could be trained to fight as well as a white man. Key said that this would mean the end of slavery. Claiborne said yes, but wouldn't independence be more important? Key wrote in his diary that Southerners, including him, wouldn't agree with independence if it meant equality of the races. Claiborne was undeterred by the skepticism of his plan, and in December, he brought the idea to his brigade commanders and regimental commanders. In all, around 14 men signed the proposal. At the beginning of December, Bragg left the Army of Tennessee. William Hardy took his place until a permanent commander could be chosen. Two days after Christmas, Joseph E. Johnston took command of the Army. Claiborne took his proposal to Hardy and asked for a meeting with the Army's general officers. Hardy knew about the proposal and was skeptical, but he was good friends with Claiborne and so, on January 2nd, 1864, a memo went out to the officers to meet at Johnston's headquarters at 7 p.m. that night. Claiborne got up in front of the other officers and began his proposal. He started out by emphasizing that the Army needed manpower. He then described that the Confederacy could expand its conscription and have cooks and teamsters join the ranks as combat troops, but then the speech took a turn. He said that using those gentlemen would take skilled white laborers away from important jobs. He then made his revolutionary suggestion that they should offer freedom to slaves who fought for the Confederacy and the freedom of their families. He stated that, as between the loss of independence and the loss of slavery, we assume that every patriot will freely give up the latter, give up the slave, rather than be a slave himself. He argued that by agreeing to this proposal, that it would nullify runaway slaves' reasoning for joining the Union Army and enlarging the enemy's numbers. He said that it could possibly create friendship between the Confederacy and England and France. Furthermore, he made no qualms about it. Claiborne knew it would hurt the institution of slavery itself and concluded that, if then we touched the institution at all, we would do best to make the most of it by emancipating the whole race. He knew that detractors would argue that that would make the Southern economy crumble so he countered it by saying that African Americans were not the only ones who could do the hard laborious jobs. That the hard duty performed by the Confederate soldiers demonstrated that whites were just as capable of hard labor in the Southern environment as African Americans. A pre-planned rebuttal was then given by Calhoun Benham. When the proposal and rebuttal was done, the floor was opened. Claiborne did not receive a warm reception. Many officers made emotional attacks against his proposal. The three that stand out as the harshest were those by William Bate, Patton Anderson, and W.H.T. Walker. Bate declared that Claiborne's proposals were hideous and objectionable, and he branded them as nothing less than the serpent of abolitionism. He thought the whole army would mutiny if that action was taken. Anderson called it a monstrous proposition that was revolting to Southern sentiment, Southern pride, and Southern honor. He was shocked that such a proposal came from a man 
whom he considered one of our bravest and most accomplished officers, and feared that it would bring down Claiborne, the universal indignation of the Southern people and Southern soldiers. Walker was the most offended, asserting that the proposal was nothing less than treason, and that any officer advocating it should be held fully accountable. Claiborne did not argue his point. He was surprised and disappointed at the hostile responses that he got from his fellow officers. Johnston told the group that Claiborne's proposal would not be sent to Richmond and ordered the men not to speak a word of it to anyone. Walker approached Claiborne, wanting a copy of the proposal so that he could send it to President Davis, defying Johnston's order. Walker wanted to bring the authority of the President down upon Claiborne for suggesting what he and others believed as a treasonous act against the Confederacy. Claiborne had a clean copy wrote out for him, removing the names of the officers who had signed it to protect them from attacks by the President or any other political official, and gave it to Walker. Claiborne stood behind his proposal, even though he knew it would probably result in backlash. Out of those who knew about the proposal, some wrote about it in their diaries. One officer said, if slavery is to be abolished, then I take no more interest in our fight. Claiborne had badly misread his audience and Southern society. In summarizing a statement by historian James McPherson, the South saw liberty and slavery as inseparable. Thomas Heinemann wrote to Johnston about Walker's disobedience to the order to keep the proposal secret. Walker was able to hand off his copy to a congressman who took it to the president. Jefferson Davis was being hit by political barbs from politicians from all over the South that he had undercut traditional Southern values by overseeing a powerful centralized government. Davis did not want the issue of arming slaves to proliferate. Such a controversial topic could tear the Confederacy apart, so he ordered James Seddon, the Secretary of War, to issue an order suppressing any discussion of the matter. In the letter, he stated that such matters and subjects were not appropriate for military officers to consider. Claiborne himself was ordered to swear the junior officers to secrecy who knew about the proposal. During this turbulent January, Claiborne took part in lighter duty. After the January 2nd meeting, Hardy informed Claiborne that he was engaged and that he wanted Patrick to be his best man. They traveled from Dalton to Montgomery, then down to Mobile. During the wedding ceremony, the maid of honor, Susan Tarleton, caught the eye of Claiborne. They spent the next several days together until Claiborne's two weeks leave was up and he had to return to the army. Before he left, he asked Susan to marry him. She didn't give him an immediate answer, but gave him permission to write her and promised that she would write him back. After a speedy courtship, Claiborne returned to his camp near Dalton. While the army had some downtime, Claiborne ordered the building of a log hut for the sole purpose as a staff officer school, where he met with his brigade commanders to discuss the art of war. He advised his brigade commanders to do the same with their regimental commanders. In late February, William Tecumseh Sherman was invading Mississippi and pushing toward the Alabama line. Leonidas Polk, scared that he could not fend off such a large attack, asked for assistance from Johnston. Johnston claimed that it was probably a diversion to take attention away from northern Georgia, but Jefferson Davis thought differently and ordered Johnston to send Hardy's Corps, or half of his army, to Polk. The troops boarded trains for Mississippi, but when they got to Montgomery, Johnston ordered them back to Dalton because federal troops were pushing southward. Claiborne returned as quickly as possible, but when he arrived, the threat had dissipated. Also, Sherman had turned back from Meridian, Mississippi. The army settled into winter quarters again, but Claiborne was on the move. For three years, he had not taken leave, but now he had taken two within six weeks. He traveled to Mobile to see Susan. After a discussion, Susan agreed to marry him. On March 12th, he traveled back to Dalton. On March 22nd, five inches of snow had fallen and covered the ground. The men were excited to play in the snow. In fact, Claiborne led Lucius Polk's brigade, his old brigade, in an attack with snowballs against Govan's brigade. In the fight, Claiborne was captured. After a short deliberation, they decided to parole the general. Claiborne then joined the fight again, leading Polk's brigade into battle. He was captured a second time and the captors had a longer deliberation on how to deal with a soldier who broke the rules of war. At first, they called for Claiborne's old punishment to make him carry a rail for a mile, but an advocate stated that since this was his first offense, they should parole him again. Claiborne returned to his lines and the snowball fight ended. On March 31st, Johnston organized a sham battle, pitting Claiborne and Bates divisions 
against Cheatham's and Walker's divisions. They fired a half dozen blank cartridges at one another, partially to keep the men trained and drilled in the art of loading and firing the rifled muskets, and partially to entertain the ladies who had ridden out from Dalton to view the army. That night, the men dined on peaches and cornbread. The first week in April, Johnston held a review of the army. Claiborne led his 7,000-man division in a stunning review in front of a crowd of ladies who rode out from Dalton. Johnston knew that the drilling and marching would prepare the men for the spring campaign season. Just 20 miles away, William T. Sherman was preparing his men for his campaign to capture Atlanta.